Welcome to this month's Conservation Conversations. I'm Sean O'Brien, the President and CEO of NatureServe. Caroline Van Hemert is uh, an adventurer and a biologist and just a really beautiful writer. And I feel um, I feel sort of at, a, at an advantage over Caroline right now because I have read her lovely book, The Sun is a Compass, um, which is available in all the places that you can buy books. Um, but I feel like I know her really, really well from having read this book because it's so personal. Um, but it's also really an amazing adventure story and amazing story of thinking about science and the way that we perceive the world. And so I want to thank you, Caroline, for writing this book and also for agreeing to be on the show this month. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. That's great. So um, I want to say that I'm a fanboy because anybody who knows me uh, knows that I have a giant bookshelf filled with uh, adventure stories, many of which take place in very cold places where um, you have taken uh, many adventures. And so it's really great to talk to a modern adventurer. And the other thing that people know about me is that I spent a lot of time in the last two years driving around in the Van Humboldt, which is named after Alexander Von Humboldt, uh, visiting natural heritage programs across the United States and Canada and visiting uh, rare and endangered plants and animals and all of those things. And so uh, a lot of people thought that was quite an adventure. Uh, these people should all go read your book right away and find out what a real adventure is. Um, so tell us just a little bit what, you know, what is the book so that we can use that as the context for the rest of the conversation? Yeah, sure. Well, thanks for the um, intro. So uh, The Sun is a Compass, it's, uh, the subtitle is A 4,000 Mile Journey into the Alaskan Wilds, but the hopefully it's a lot more than just an adventure narrative. Um, but essentially the, the trip began, I mean, began really decades ago in terms of the dreaming, but we um, set off from Bellingham, Washington. So sort of Puget Sound region, not far from Seattle, for those of you from that part of the world. And with the intention of heading up to the Arctic and specifically to the Northwestern part of Alaska. And so it was roughly 4,000 miles and um, we did it by rowboat. So little hand-built um, like 18 foot sliding seat rowboats um, up the inside passage and then transitioned to skiing and pack rafts. So for those folks who aren't familiar with pack rafts are these cool little inflatable boats that essentially allow you to be amphibious on the landscape because you can roll them up and put them in your backpack. And then when you get to a place where there's no bridge and um, you need to cross water, which is frequent in the North, um, as many of you know, then you have a boat and you paddle across and you make your way. And so we, we got into the headwaters of the Yukon River by way of the coast mountains and um, there took a canoe up to uh, the Arctic. So into the Wind River and eventually into the um, Mackenzie River and the Mackenzie Delta, which is a story in its own right, uh, because it's <laughs> a place where I've encountered more mosquitoes and more mud uh, than anywhere I've been, which is saying something having spent 40 some years in Alaska. And then traveled along the Arctic coast and um, sort of joined up uh, at the headwaters, or excuse me, of the entry to the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. We took a, a turn south, joined the crest of the Brooks Range, and then traversed the Brooks Range by foot and pack raft um, to the Chukchi Sea and to Kotzebue, the village of Kotzebue. So that's kind of the what we did. And I guess the, the why we did it and some of those other questions are probably more interesting to ultimately talk about. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned the we. So this is you and your husband, Patrick Farrell. And uh, yeah, you thank you. built the um, sliding canoes that you were talking about earlier. Um, and I, I think that's amazing. And there's interesting pictures of those available for people. The thing that's so amazing to me about this is uh, in the modern era, it's so hard to be this disconnected. You know, you had a satellite phone with you for emergencies and to contact your family, but basically, except for during resupply times, unless you amazingly ran into people in their cabins on rivers and things like that, you're in places where very few human feet have ever touched. And in the modern era, like I live in Virginia, everywhere in Virginia has been clear cut multiple times. You can't walk anywhere in Virginia where hundreds of people haven't put their foot before you. And so much of where you were, you may have been the first person in a thousand years to put your foot on that spot in the world. 
Yeah, possibly. You know, the, the, a lot of the areas we went, um, they don't get much traffic. They Some of them were national parks, but sort of by definition, we were exploring those in-between spaces because, you know, to connect the, the coast to the headwaters of the Yukon River to the Arctic coast um, required that we did all the, the in-between. And I think some of those were the most... Um, interesting because they were really unexpected. We didn't go in with a destination in mind, but um, got to sort of see how wildlife moved across the landscape. You know, there was amazing, I'm an ornithologist by training. And so to to get to track some of these bird species, quite literally from um, Bellingham all the way up to the Arctic coast. I mean, of course, they were much more efficient and made it look a lot easier than we did, but we would, we would kind of hopscotch with them um, along the way. And that was really a neat gift um, to be able to see how they sort of connected these, these different really disparate landscapes. You know, many places people have been on the landscape, um, traditionally or over, you know, many, many years because they're homelands, um, of a lot of indigenous peoples. And those were the folks that we went to because, you know, when you go to plan something like this, you can look at a, at a map and you can try to figure out how am I going to get from point A to point B, but what it looks like on the map and even what it looks like on the satellite imagery doesn't necessarily match up with, with what you're actually going to find on the ground. And so as we came into communities, you know, people were incredibly generous with sharing kind of their knowledge of the land. And that was a, a really neat connection point too, is I don't think a lot of people show up, you know, on foot or by boat. And so it was an easier way to, to initially sort of connect with people and to be able to share, you know, what we had learned and what they had learned from, um, spending time in in their home um but i think that generations on the landscape even many generations yeah yeah but some of those places you know really there there is no reason to go um or (laughs) maybe not a reason to go at the time of year we went uh so when we told people we're heading into the mackenzie delta it was like ooh, yeah i don't know that i would do that (laughs) yeah Um, but you know already kind of committed at that point to to staying the course to get to the arctic coast and you look at a map again and it's like well we want to get from um you know, sort of the Mackenzie up to the Arctic coast. Well, follow the river. That would be logical. And uh, in some ways it was, and in other ways it was, yeah, almost failure by pure misery. (laughs) You know, on this show, we're normally talking about uh, biodiversity and nature and things like that. And we were talking a lot about the adventure, but one of the things that's so fun in the book as a little bit of a bird nerd is the callbacks to birds and how they're, affecting your perception of what's happening and like what you said before about how gracefully and how easily they may get from one place to another and you're slogging along carrying 60 or 80 pounds on your back and then if you don't get resupplied what are you going to do and these birds are just flying and eating on the wing so to speak yeah that was the probably the biggest theme not only in the book but really of my um experience and Pat's experience on on the trip is just this this sense of being kind of one of this massive you know migration taking place and that sort of wondrous fact of of nature of these these birds that do these really remarkable things that we kind of take for granted you know you, springtime comes you see all these birds show up and it's like oh uh, I guess the birds are uh, arriving but you know we don't often think about where how far they've come all of the sort of trials and tribulations that they've had to deal with along the way and so that part of it as an ornithologist it was just really quite fantastic to see them making their way and also to you know we'd be up in an ice field and inevitably if we're up in the snow and ice you'll find evidence of birds that didn't make it you know skeleton of a surf scoter up at 4,000 feet and you know these, these sort of like magical little clues of what it actually looks like to be a bird in the world and trying to make your way. Um, so that, that part was really incredible. I think from the book perspective too, I, I don't feel like I really found my voice um, or figured out what the story was about until I let the birds guide me um, as <laughs> kind of cheesy as that sounds, but that was, yeah, that was ultimately the driving um, sort of narrative for who I am as a scientist and, you know, what I took away from the experience was it all came back to the birds in the end. So the other migration you talk about in there is the caribou migration and the magical moment you all had when they were like the herd was going around you and you were sort of in the midst and smelling them and hearing them. 
And I'm just thinking about like the large landscapes and the kinds of wildlife that live in those areas. And but do you have a perspective on this that most of us can't get because we don't have the experience of those kinds of landscapes, much less being in the midst of a herd of thousands of large mammals that are transversing this, this landscape? Yeah, well, so the caribou were also really important, particularly when we got to the Arctic um, for lots of reasons. I mean, just because it's amazing to be in the company of caribou, no matter where you are. Um, but we came to rely on them really heavily uh, in terms of route finding. So I mentioned, you know, meeting people and having them explain, like, this is how I would travel if you're going this direction. Um, but when it really came down to like feet on the ground, uh, you know, paddling down a river, we were always looking for the caribou to be our guides because they knew best and they they've known best for thousands and thousands of years. And, you know, there were a handful of times where we're like, ah, this doesn't look quite like the crossing we want to make. It's a little deep. It's a little cold. We'll just stay on this side of the river. And sure enough, it was the wrong side. Um, and we would find that out in usually quite dramatic ways. You know, you get to this sheer cliff and it's clear that you're not going anywhere or, um, yeah, just get into this real wallow of thick brush because there wasn't a caribou trail and that was not the right way to go. So I think we kind of came to rely on the caribou wisdom. And, and I think that that bodily sense of shifting away from your own intuition and sort of trusting the natural world and trusting these creatures that, that don't have, you know, what we would consider like the same sort of intelligence that we, we do necessarily, but they have a very, very deep um, sense of, of knowledge and uh, intelligence that leaning into that was, was a really neat experience. And so the, the culmination of that, of that time with the caribou, as you mentioned, was at the, this moment where we were coming toward the, what we thought was going to be the end of the trip um, and kind of a, not to give too many spoilers away, but we ran into some problems um, as you might expect. Yes, and did. so, yeah, <laughs> it, there was a little bit of starvation. There was a predatory bear. There was a lot of snow, um, some really steep, sketchy passes. But anyway, we had sort of made it through some of these challenges and we're paddling down what was going to be the very last stretch of river um, before we finished this trip. And so there was a lot of ideas and thoughts swirling in, I think, both of our minds just as, as far as like, what did this look like? We had done this you know, thing and spent six months more or less um, off grid and alone. And uh, but it was a wet day and it was kind of nasty out and we both had our hoods up on our rain on our rain jackets and I remember glancing up and just seeing what looked like a, a log or a branch floating across the river and it turned out it was a caribou antler and then there was another and another and we crossed paths with the western arctic caribou herd on their fall migration and um, pulled the boat over pulled the canoe over and I sat on shore and thought wow this is amazing we've seen you know 100 caribou swim this river and then all of a sudden there's just this wave of sound that comes from behind us and we kind of duck down and suddenly we're surrounded by like hundreds and thousands of caribou as they're just doing their thing. And we're yeah. just sitting there sort of bearing witness to it. And to be in the midst of that much sort of collective energy and power was, yeah, but unlike anything I've ever experienced. So that, that will stay with me forever. Um, yeah. And I think that sense of, like you're saying, being a very small speck on a big landscape and you know being witness to something much larger than yourself is certainly one of the things that I always seek out in the natural world. And um, I'm guessing a lot of adventurers and scientists do as well. Yeah. So one of the other themes through your book is the sort of struggle you're having with your future and what direction you're going to go. Are you going to become a sort of a desk scientist in some ways? Um, are you going to do something different? And ultimately, uh, as I understand it, you accepted a position with the USGS to be a biologist there. So tell us a little bit about what you do now. Sure. Yeah. So uh, sort of setting out on that trip, I was just finishing my PhD. And so as, as you mentioned, Sean, that was like this kind of cusp of making a decision. Um, so I did, I, I work now for um, the USGS Alaska Science Center as a research biologist, and I do a lot of wildlife health uh, studies. So that can span everything from um, looking at, you know, infectious disease and, and birds and, and various other critters to um, addressing environmental hazards like uh, harmful algal blooms in um, ocean waters that can affect seabirds and a, a whole lot of other critters. 
so yeah, a little bit of everything, but I do kind of a mix of the field component, um, fair bit of lab work, although that's often with collaborators and then presenting results and, uh, traditional scientific outlets of journals and conferences and that sort of thing. And um, I don't know, you're, you've lived in Alaska now for what you said, I think more than 40 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> to give away my age. <laughs> well, you said it, I didn't. Um, <laughs> but so one of the, the things that you've experienced just as a person living in Alaska over the last 40 years is a lot of change not just in the in the like the population of the people, but in the environment. And I'm just curious, you know, that's not part of what you study, I don't think is climate change, but sort of anecdotally thinking about your time in Alaska and um, what you've seen there, because we all know that the Arctic is warming faster than the middle part of the, lat the middle latitudes. And so, you know, we're experiencing climate change here in Virginia but I think you're experiencing it a little bit differently. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts on how that's affecting the critters and, and plants up in your area. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts. And actually a lot of my research does stem um, from, you know, changes related to climate warming. So we're a lot of the things that we're seeing pop up in wildlife um, are, are new or as far as we know, are, you know, emerging um, as a result of some of the changes taking place. I think personally, uh, I can, you can't live in Alaska and not sort of face these realities on a pretty daily basis, and particularly working in the realm of, of climate, you know, change biology or wildlife biology. That is the driving narrative, I would say, that there's, there's nothing else up here that as, is as um, important in terms of how things are changing and how quickly. Um, there's certainly lots of other factors that are important for conservation, but yeah, the climate piece of it is is front and center all the time. Um, you know, I think personally, one of the ways that I try to make sense of it is through writing and then through literature and um, arts, because there is a point at which you know the data can tell us so much, and then we have to figure out how we're going to make sense of that in our own minds, and then how we're going to act on it and um, they both have really important roles, but I think, you know, one point, one of our previous email exchanges, we talked a little bit about, you know, science and storytelling and um, how important that component is. And increasingly, I feel like that is really central to any hope we have for conservation actions. And certainly, you know, the Van Humboldt and uh, some of the other things that you've been involved with, which I'd love to chat about too. I think that that storytelling and that, that connection um, between people and the places that, you know, maybe in their backyards or may not, but nonetheless are so central to the quality of our lives and to the health of the planet. I think those are, those aren't separable anymore that the storytelling piece of it. So yeah. I, I kind of try to balance my, my scientific um, person or uh, persona and my sort of artistic and creative persona. And, you know, ideally those can mesh. There are certainly some boundaries there, particularly being a federal scientist, but that increasingly I feel like the writing and communicating is uh, so so much of a responsibility that we have um, as scientists and people who care about conservation. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a bit older than you are. And one of the things that I found in graduate school was I was probably on the early end of people studying science and getting PhDs in ecology and things like that who were actually coming to it from sort of a conservation standpoint first and then coming into sort of the academic side. And so I was fortunate to be in grad school and as a postdoc with people who are now leaders in the conservation field. And it's super exciting to see where they've gone. Um, and that wasn't something that the generation we were, I was learning from did. They were just doing science and they just happened to be doing it around biodiversity before the term even existed. Um, and so I thinking about the storytelling component, especially right now, right? It's easy for people to experience climate change because we feel the temperature and we have these amazing heat waves and all of the fires that we're dealing with in North America right now. Um, but the thing that's hard to experience is extinction. Mm. And yes, in the 1800s, the passenger pigeon of which there were billions and billions went extinct. And we 
are maybe willing to declare the ivory-billed woodpecker extinct and there's things like the auk or the dodo or something um, but on a day-to-day -day basis a person has a hard time experiencing extinction it's it's essentially also proving a negative and so one of the things that we've been trying to do at NatureServe is figure out how to tell that story of rarity or the specialness of rare things. And that's one of the reasons why I think your adventure and the way you talk about what's going on there is so important is because you're, you're bringing nature into people's lives in a way that they can then relate to and then perhaps expand that knowledge or that experience into other settings uh, of their life so that we can talk about the extinction crisis that's happening the same way we talk about the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that we, you know, we, the public, the sort of <laughs> broader public, we often underestimate people's interest and ability to take up these sort of complex, you know, we, we term them scientific, but, you know, sort of natural history stories um, because people do care deeply and they have great capacity for, for understanding and, and interest, but we can't sort of hold this double standard of sharing, you know, one horrible, horrifying statistic after the next. And I, I can't take that in as, as a human um, over and over and over without sort of a narrative to help me find my way out of it. And so I think those, those moments where you can sort of transform the, the really generic, you know, disaster crisis <laughs> language scenarios into, um, you know, certainly moments of, of hope and action, but also just that to make it individual, to make it relevant to our individual lives, because it it's too much to ask to say that you're going to get this sort of stream of <laughs> bad news um, yeah. day in, day out and and figure out what to do with it. I mean, that yeah, that's that's a I'm contradiction so we all said, hold. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad you said hope and action, because that's the thing that I experienced a couple of years ago when I was first on the, the tour in the Van Humboldt kept visiting all of these incredibly rare species. And many of them are these, what are called one known occurrence where they only exist in one place in the world. And through bad luck or through malfeasance, that species could go away in an afternoon because of something that happens. And I found myself sort of getting depressed about the future because of all of these really rare plants and animals and some of them were protected and some of them weren't. And um, so I started asking the people who are working with them every day, like, how do you do it? Like you're with, you know, these plants that almost nobody's ever seen and they could, they could disappear from the earth. And they're like, yeah, but we know where they are. We know what they are. Therefore we can do something about it. We can take action to save them. And so I have incredible hope for the future because we have all of this information now and we're able to use whether it's computers or whatever to bring all this information together to get to action. And I thought that was very heartening. Uh, yeah. To hear. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just, you know, sort of opening our minds to, to thinking about relating to our science differently to relating to know how we think about I and mean, there's interestingly i saw fish and wildlife just recently approved i think it was fish and wildlife approved um the ability to relocate endangered species to habitats that they didn't um occur in you know sort of historically in response to climate change so some of these just like adaptive strategies i think are you know we're, we're having a bit of a reckoning within ecology and within conservation because we've leaned so for so long on this idea of like kind of bounce back resilience that we're going to return to some former steady state, which was probably, you know, a bit of a um, falsehood to begin with. Yeah. Um, but that, you know, that, that is how a lot of sort of traditional ecological theory has been framed. And so as we're working through that as scientists, I think at the same time, we sort of have this responsibility as humans to be thinking about, yeah, like how, how does this translate not just into, you know, doom and gloom and, and feeling depressed and sad, but like, okay, how do we look at the world differently? It's not going to be the same place that, that it was, you know, for me as a child or for you as a child, or for that you know, matter, you know, 10 years ago, I mean, we are seeing changes on the landscape up here and, you know, a matter of a few years often. I mean, I feel like I sort of got into conservation science and field biology, real starry eyed, um, yeah. you know, had Barry Lopez and, uh, you know, the sort of guide to the Arctic and some of these 
different references and it really felt like a, a wide open um just love for the natural world i wasn't thinking so much at that point in terms of like what are we losing um you know the conservation action seemed more like tangible things that you were going to do and not this big massive pulse of um climate change and like how do you address this mm-hmm. but but i think yeah just trying to sort of shift the narrative to one that isn't doesn't feel always bleak and hopeless and that's i think in my mind one power of combining science and art and um you know storytelling in its various forms is that we can think more creatively we can sort of open our minds to other possibilities in ways that can be harder to do in a traditional scientific framework yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that that's necessary for engaging people and getting people to support the money that it's going to take to preserve nature for the future. You know, it used to be, we thought it was as simple as just setting aside pieces of land mm. that they could just do their thing. And now, as you said, we need to do adaptive strategies where we anticipate where something might be able to live in the future so that if we're planting cultivars or captive bred species, we can put them in a place where they'll be able to survive, not 50 years ago, but in 50 years. Yeah, absolutely. And I think understanding the extremes, you know, that's another thing that I I do take um, a certain amount of comfort just from, you see these really remarkable feats of um, sort of natural history and even evolution. And you're like, yeah, how, how is this even possible? Like, we don't even really fully understand how it is that birds, you know, know to get from one place to another. We know a lot more than we used to, but there, there's still this sort of magic piece of it. I think that um, that that sense of, of awe or wonder and exploring the, the edges of, of what's possible, I think does sort of give some indication of like how we might think about things in the future. And I have a colleague who I remember talking with him one day and he was um, talking about taxonomy and how, you know, he it was so important to get the taxonomy right for these little Arctic invertebrates that, you know, at face value, you'd kind of be like, well, yeah, sure, it matters what you call them, but does it really? But then I realized that what his point was one that sort of taxonomy in itself can be this act of resistance, because if you don't understand the edges of those extremes of like what's possible um, when we think about life on this planet right now, then, you know, how can you sort of imagine what the future is going to look like when everything is pushed to extremes? So, yeah, I've been trying to sort of take up those those lessons in less conventional forms, um, both from other scientists and also from other artists and writers who yeah. are helping me to see the possibilities when sometimes they feel limited. So we think a lot about taxonomy here because we ask we ask three questions. What is it? Where is it? And how is it doing? And the what is it question is incredibly complicated mm. because especially in plants, Taxonomy is a little bit more challenging than it is, especially with things like birds that are pretty well known. But invertebrates, beetles, all of these things, the, the what is it question, the, the margin of error on how many species we actually think are on the planet is so large as to be absurd. And mm-hmm. we can't even describe the ones we know, much less ones we haven't yet discovered yet or described. Yeah, absolutely. And what is what an essential piece of it all right it's like yeah right. and I think even making that translatable to to people who aren't intimately involved or aren't you know taxonomists themselves it's like why does this matter well it actually matters deeply um, but maybe not for the reasons that we would think that somebody wants you know some little slug named after them or something but <laughs> <laughs> because yeah if we don't know what it is that is out there how can we best um, sort of help in the act of conserving it and when we think about the things that evolution has done in terms of figuring out how to survive, whether it's the physiology of birds when they're migrating or uh, a plant's ability to resist something or to grow on soils that are toxic to other plants, the things that we can learn from nature and from what evolution has produced means that it's actually really important to know what everything is so that you can identify where the opportunities are to sort of take advantage of what nature has already figured out. Right, right. Yeah, we tend to underestimate what nature already <laughs> has taken care of us, uh, care, taken care of for us in terms of like, yeah, figuring out some really complex systems. And, yeah. um, and I think probably what has drawn me originally to science or what did draw me originally to science is, is that sense of just the remarkable nature of, of life on this planet. And so as much as we can sort of allow ourselves the luxury of 
indulging um, in that, I think it it helps keep the the energy up and the sort of fight, for lack of a better word, um, to do these things that matter so much. So you just made a nice segue for me into your inspiration for what you do. And I've read your book. And so I know a little bit about what your inspiration was. And it sounds like your parents um, were pretty incredible in terms of engaging you with nature and getting you interested in basically the career path that you're on now. Yeah. So I grew up uh, in Alaska and had, you know, great access to being outside and my parents were sort of adventurers in their own right. Um, they climbed Denali by dog sled and kind of the long way. And um, yeah, so anyway, they, they definitely sort of introduced me to some elements of, of adventure as a child. I was a bit slow, honestly, to, to come to adventure. I was always really reluctant as a child. I had my nose in books um, every chance I, I had. And so I was happy for, for many years to sort of chase other people's stories of uh, trials and tribulations. Um, and only later did I come back to it kind of on my own terms. Well, you certainly embraced it in a big way. And uh, <laughs> I think as I understand it, you're going to be embracing it more in a big way. Um, and I'll like to say that you're following in the steps of people like Darwin and von Humboldt and uh, taking to the sea um, as part of your adventures and your study of the of the biology of the planet. So tell us what's what's next for you. Yeah, so I should probably sort of preface it by saying I, I have two children um, now who are seven and nine, two little boys. Um, so our family has done a variety of, you know, sort of different adventures. We've lived remotely at various times and um, yeah, gotten out there. But one of the things that we've been doing a lot more of recently is sailing. And so in about a week, um, we'll be setting off by sailboat for a year or to be determined. Um, but plan is it's actually the boat right now is in, is in the Mediterranean. And so we're going to be leaving and heading up to the Arctic, but on the Atlantic side. So it'll be really, uh, really excited to, to get North, but in a different part of the world and see kind of the connections and the differences and, uh, explore a whole new, um, yeah, Arctic for me. That's exciting. And are you going to be documenting this along the way, or are you going to save it all and make us wait for a book in the future? <laughs> um, hopefully a little bit of both. You know, I'm trying to be realistic about um, time expectations in, in terms of we'll be doing some homeschooling and you know, figuring out all of the, the sailing pieces and um, navigation. But yeah, hopefully I'll be doing some, some writing along the way. And um, I guess don't know what the story is going to be until it happens. <laughs> That's right. The adventure is still, still awaits. Um, so I have one last question and that is your thinking about your legacy. So you have these two sons who are going to be sailing with you and um, you're thinking a lot about the world. Obviously you're thinking about climate change and you're thinking about biodiversity. And I think um, you know, when you write a book like The Sun is a Compass, some of this is a memoir and telling your story, but some of it is about, I think, inspiring other people and getting people interested in the world around them and being introspective. And so I'm thinking about your goals for, you know, when, when your kids are your age and somebody says to them, you know, tell me about your mom, what, what would you like for them to say? Ooh, that's a tough one. <laughs> just to leave us on a light note. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, I was just, as you were speaking, I was just thinking about how much I've learned from them. And so I guess what I would really hope that I can teach them is to remember how to be a kid, because I think ultimately that child's view is really akin to being a, a true naturalist is that they, the ability to be in the moment, to be looking carefully at something and to appreciate what sort of at face value sometimes seems like, you know, really mundane or, or um, ordinary that in fact, that little bug, um, you know, crawling across the sidewalk or across, you know, some Arctic lagoon um, that there's just a whole lot there. So I think I would hope that, yeah, they, they feel that I gave them that, that sort of gift and the permission to, to continue to be a kid well into adulthood um, from the perspective of how we approach the world and, our willingness to, to find creative solutions and, and to think about things outside the bounds of what we already know. I think that's really 
the way forward um, as much as I see it. And so, yeah. Yeah, I think that's awesome because basically what you're saying is you want them to remain curious and to continue to be excited about things that they see and that they learn. And we should all aspire to do that for our entire lives because it makes life more fun, but it also, you can discover things and you can lose yourself watching a caddis fly go across the bottom of some little stream. And uh, I did that not that long ago, which is why it's fresh in my head. Um, and they are just, so cool. Yeah, I know. <laughs> they're amazing. Yeah. Um, so great. Well, Caroline, thank you so much for taking time to be with us on Conservation Conversations. Um, and we we'll really wish you great luck on the on the boat. What's the name of the boat? It's called Turnstone, um, uh, as in, yeah, Ready Turnstone. Ready turnstone. turnstone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so it may make its way down to the, the Caribbean, which would be appropriate um, migratory pathway-wise. So yeah, we'll get into the Arctic and then we have some, some decisions to make as to which way to turn. But um, yeah, anyhow, the yeah, thanks so much. It's been really fun to chat with you and thanks for taking the time to let me talk a little bit about adventures and other things. And yeah, I look forward to staying in touch and we'll try to keep you updated with blog or otherwise. I've still got to get that part sorted out, but um, yeah, thanks awesome. again. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, thanks to the listeners for listening this month to conservation conversations. I'm Sean O'Brien with nature serve. And uh, if you enjoyed this conversation, uh, please do all the things that you're supposed to do with podcasts and give us nice ratings on all of your favorite listening platforms. And um, NatureServe is a nonprofit organization and we're partially supported with the kindness of uh, our supporters. And so if you're interested in making a donation to NatureServe, you can go to natureserve.org and do that. And you can learn more about other work that we do and you can find links to this podcast and to other things related to Caroline and to other podcasts from uh, NatureServe. So thanks again for listening and thanks again, Caroline Van Hemert. Thank you.